Hey everyone, I'm Charles Judd, and in this video, we're going to look at the 1.2c topic of static routing. Now, I've briefly looked at using static routes in my video covering administrative distance, specifically how we can use floating static routes to create backup routes in our network. So here, I wanna just round out that topic a bit and fill in a few of the gaps, starting with the different types of static routes. We can group static routes into three main classifications. We have directly connected static routes, recursive static routes, and fully specified static routes. A directly connected or directly attached static route is fairly self-explanatory. This is a static route that uses only the outbound next hop interface in order to get to a destination network. The router assumes that the destination network is directly connected to the outbound interface that you specify. We commonly see this used with point-to-point -point interfaces, especially point-to-point -point serial interfaces. These types of connections don't have to worry about address resolution or any adjacency tables, so we can use a static route to direct traffic in that kind of situation. In this topology, you can see we have a couple of routers interconnected over the 172.16.10.0 slash 30 network. R1 is connected to the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network, and R2 is connected to the 20.1.1.0 slash 24 network we can use a directly attached static route entry in order to point R1 toward the 20.1.1.0 network and to point R2 toward the 10.1.1.0 network. Here we're connected to R1 and this is really simple to do. Let's see if we can ping R2 at 172.16.10.2. That is successful, so we can of course reach our attached 10.1.1.0 network as well, but let's try to ping over to the 20.1.1.0 network that is attached to R2. And that of course is going to time out and fail. We can use a directly attached static route pointing to the 20.1.1.0 slash 24 network to solve this. So let's do that. Let's go under global configuration mode and let's say IP route followed by the network we're trying to reach, which is 20.1.1.0 with a 24-bit subnet mask, and at the end, we're going to specify, in this case, our outbound next hop interface, which is gig zero slash zero in the case of my lab. If we enter that and we break out, now let's again try to ping the 20.1.1.1 IP address of R2, and yes, we are able to do that. If we say show IP route, we can see this network available in our routing table. Here we see that 20.1.1.0 network. Notice we're told that it is directly connected to gig zero slash zero, which is of course what we would expect. And at the beginning, we see the S code letting us know that this is a directly connected static route. If we check our code table at the top, S indicates that this is a static route. If we jump to R2, and let's try to ping 10.1.1.1, which is the remote interface, by the way, on R1, if you look in our topology, and we're not successful in this direction. So we also need a directly connected static route configured here. So let's do that. Under global configuration mode, let's say IP route 10.1.1.0, our 24-bit subnet mask, and we want to say gig zero slash zero. That is our connected interface. If we break out and now ping, 10.1.1.1. We're going to be able to do that this time. So we do see that is successful. Let's also take a look at the output of a show IP route command to look at our routing table. And we're gonna see a similar story here. We have a directly connected static route on gig zero slash zero pointing over to the 10.1.1.0 network. The next classification of static routes that we want to look at are recursive static routes. You may be familiar with the term recursive or recursion from computer science theory or from programming. Recursion is a programming technique involving the use of a subroutine or a subfunction or an algorithm where there can be multiple repetitions processed until a specific condition is met. When we're talking about recursive static routes, very simply, these are routes that point to a different route within our routing table 
rather than pointing to a directly connected link. So if we're looking at our same topology with a recursive static route, rather than using the outbound interface, we're using a next hop IP address. Our router, let's say we're on R1, and instead of using gig 0 slash 0, we're going to use the next hop IP address of 172.16.10.2. Our router is going to query its local routing information base or its rib to locate a route towards that next hop IP address that we configure. And then it's going to find the associated interface to use. Now, this does require that the next hop address that you're specifying, of course, exists in the routing table. That is necessary. The difference in using a recursive static route versus a directly connected static route really comes down to whether you're indicating an outgoing interface or a next hop IP address. And which one you choose really depends on your specific needs. So if we're using a point to point interface, as we see here, or if we're using serial point to point interfaces, then it really doesn't matter which one you use. If you're using a multi point interface where multiple devices can be connected to a single interface, then it's preferable to use a next hop IP address for the static route. Or in other words, it's preferable to use a recursive static route with multi point connections in a multi point or broadcast network. Using the outbound interface is not considered to be a scalable solution and the next hop address is preferred. Another advantage for using that is that if there are multiple interfaces providing a path to the same destination, Using recursive static routing may allow the static route to remain installed into the routing table, even if that link fails and requires a different outbound interface to be used. So just for completion, I want to show you how that works at the command line here on router one. Let's go under global configuration mode and let's remove our current configured directly connected static route. So I'm going to arrow up. I'm just going to prepend the no keyword in front of that to remove that static route. And I'm going to jump over to R2. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm just going to take those directly connected static routes out of there and we'll start fresh. So I'm going back to router one. Actually, let's try to ping from router one. Let's try to ping 20.1.1.1, which was previously successful. But after removing those static routes, that, of course, is going to fail. So let's configure this as a recursive static route. Let's go back under global configuration mode and let's say IP route. And we want to go to 20.1.1.0. That's the network that we're targeting with, of course, our 24 bit subnet mask. And instead of saying interface gig zero slash zero, we're going to use our next hop IP address, which is 172.16.10.2. You can see in our topology, that is the next hop IP address that's on router two. So let's hit enter there. Let's go to R2 now, and we're going to do something very similar. And I'm just going to arrow up to our original IP route command that we see. Rather than the interface, I'm going to use the next hop IP address 172.16.10.1. We'll hit enter and let's break out of here now and let's try to ping from router two. 10.1.1.1. Of course, that is successful. We'll just verify the other side as well. Try to ping 20.1.1.1 from router one. And that is also successful. The final classification to look at for static routes are fully specified static routes, which combines both of the techniques that we've already looked at. A fully specified static route is going to be configured with both an outbound interface and a next hop IP address with our modern devices, which use Ceph Cisco express forwarding fully specified static routes really aren't necessary any longer. And we would again, fall back to the recommendation of using our recursive static routes of using a next hop address rather than an outgoing interface. So, Fully specified static routes, those were most commonly used in older iOS versions prior to Ceph. The configuration command is essentially the same as we've already looked at, except we indicate both the outgoing interface and the next hop IP address. We add both of those to the end of the IP route command. One final topic I want to look at with static routing 
is the concept of a static null route. These can be used as a way to drop network traffic in order to prevent routing loops. These are normal static routes that point to a null interface, which is a special type of virtual interface found within iOS. Let's talk about a case where we might see this used. If you look at our topology, we have an ISP router connected to R1. The ISP is providing a block of networks to this customer, which is the 20.1.0.0 slash 20 network. So this customer has a really large range of potential addresses. However, you can see that only a few of those networks are currently in use. We see the 20 1.1.0 network, the 20.1.2.0 network, and the 20.1.3.0 network. If we connect here to our ISP router, let's say show run, I want to pipe to include IP route, and you're going to be able to see the currently configured routes on this router. We have a static route on our ISP router, and that's using the outbound interface gig 0 slash 1. And the next hop IP address 172.16.10.2, which is of course R1 or the customer site. And also, by the way, since we didn't configure a fully specified static route in the command line interface, that's why I put one of those routes in this ISP router, just so you could have a look at what that looks like. So just as we see here, it's the interface ID followed by the IP address. So it's really simple to implement. So let's say from our ISP router that we have a packet that's maybe originating from the public internet and it's trying to reach the 20.1.5.0 slash 24 network. That is a valid network within this customer's allocated address block, but it's not one that we have in use at the moment. So let's simulate this with a trace route command from our ISP router. Let's say trace route 20.1.5. Dot one. And when we do that, you'll notice that, of course, this trace route will eventually time out. And we see this packet is bouncing between 172.16.10.1 and 172.16.10.2. We can see that's just bouncing back and forth over and over and over for all of these trace route outputs. If you look at our topology, of course, those addresses are our ISP router and router one. So what's happening here? Well, the ISP router is sending the packet to R1 because of our static route that we just looked at. Let's jump over to R1, and from here, let's say show run pipe to include IP route. So we're gonna run the same command just to see what we have configured, and we're gonna see a static default route pointing to our ISP as well. We see that here, indicated by the all zeros network and subnet mask. So this is our default static route, and that's a very common configuration pointing out to the ISP. So we're saying that if we don't have an exact route in our routing table for a network, then go out to the public internet instead, what we call our gateway of last resort. If we say show IP route, we of course won't see a specific route for the 20.1.5.0 network that we performed the trace route on. We haven't allocated that network yet. So R1 is going to look for the best match. And what R1 is going to see in the routing table is the default route that we see here at the top, our default static route over 172.16.10.1. So that's gonna point back to our ISP router. Of course, this is looping and continuing in the network. And that's what we see from our trace route output on the ISP router. We see that trace route just bouncing back and forth between the ISP and router one, creating a routing loop. So we can use a static null route to guard against this very easily. So let's go, actually let's go back to R1 and let's go under global configuration mode. Let's say IP route, our network block is 20.1.0.0 with a slash 20 mask, so 255.255.240.0. And if we look at contextual help, we have a lot of options here in the output, but we wanna use the keyword that we see here, which is null. This is going to create a null virtual interface in iOS. And you can see that if we look at contextual help after that, 
We just simply need to give that an interface number and we need to give that interface number zero. Now, once we've done that, let's go back to the ISP router and let's again try that trace route command. And what we're going to notice this time is that our trace route stops at R1 and it lets us know that this host is unreachable. We're still able to reach our valid networks. So if we try to ping a valid network, let's say 20.1.3.1, that is still successful. And of course, 20.1.2.1 is successful as well. Let's jump back to router one briefly and look at the routing table and talk about why this corrects our issue. If we say show IP route, we can see our static null route configured here. So now when we have traffic coming into one of our unallocated networks, instead of using our gateway of last resort, this null route is gonna be seen as the best match and it's gonna direct those packets to that virtual interface and it's going to drop that traffic. Now, of course, there are other ways this can be done easily with access control lists, but I did want to make you aware of the concept of a static null route and how we can use that for routing loop prevention. So that's a look at configuring some different options for static routing. I hope you found this content useful and I want to thank you sincerely for watching.